Once known as Loch Orbson or Loch Orib, this magnificent Irish limestone lake is known today by anglers far and wide simply as the Corrib, a truly natural environment which supports perhaps the best known wild brown trout fishing in Europe. Its remote location on the western seaboard has protected the Corrib from many of the environmental problems associated with the modern world. Its clear waters and underlying geology make it the perfect habitat for the upwinged flies, known collectively as the mayflies. Along with its sister lochs, Loch Cara and Loch Mask, these lakes become a magnet for anglers from all over Europe who come to fish the mayfly. The name mayfly conjures up all sorts of different images for different anglers throughout the world. To many, mayfly applies to all of the upwing flies of many varieties and species, collectively known as the Ephemeroptera. However, in Ireland, we tend to differentiate between the different species, referring to them as pond or lake olives, mayfly, canis, and so on. The flies which primarily concern us on the Corrib are the lake olive, Chloeon simi, and the fly we generally know as the mayfly, Ephemera danica. Following the early season hatches of chironomids, such as the duck fly, late April sees the first hatches of lake olives. These flies require clear alkaline water and occur in the shallow, sheltered bays and inlets of the loch. The nymphs require a lake bottom covered by moss and vegetation and are not found in the wave-washed, rocky areas. The lake olive nymph is extremely important to the angler. It's quite an active nymph and relatively bulky when compared to, say, chironomid pupa. The nymph has modified gills along its abdomen and its tail has been adapted for swimming. The olive duns can vary considerably in color. The early hatches can be very dark, almost black, known locally as sooties. Later hatches are more olive in color, changing to an almost golden olive color as the season progresses. All shades may be present at any one time, depending on the location from which they're hatching. This leads to a great complexity of fly patterns and colors used by the angler. Roy sets out to fish the olive nymph. He chooses to anchor up in a light breeze so that he can cover the area where the olives are hatching. He's using a weighted nymph on the point and a slimly tied olive pattern on the dropper. His rod is 10 feet with a weight forward number six floating line. He releases sections of the anchor rope about three yards at a time, allowing the boat to drift forward slowly so that he can cover new ground. That was a strange take, possibly a small perch, a fish you frequently come across when nymph fishing. No, this is something different, a salmon smolt, a fish which requires careful handling, or more properly, no handling at all. The protective mucus layer on these fish is especially important to protect them on their journey to the sea, and all effort should be made not to damage it. It's hard to believe that this tiny fish could return here in just over a year's time as a five, six or seven pound grilse, or one sea winter salmon. Roy changes tactics to dry fly fishing. He selected a quieter piece of water where olive duns are being blown along and being caught in the calm in the shelter of an island. He fishes two Caldecanard dries, each tied with different colored body material and a sparse hackle, holding the rod tip high to allow the fish time to turn down on his fly. The initial take of a trout taking dry olives can be an extremely splashy and noisy affair. It's as if the fish are not sure about the dry fly and slash at it. There's something peculiar about fish taking the dry olive, which is intrinsically linked to conditions. With some justification, some anglers are convinced that trout don't like olives. 
There are times when the lake can be completely carpeted by fly and not one single trout showing any interest in them whatsoever. It's as if the olive has some inbuilt protection system that deters trout from taking them. On other occasions, trout can be seen coming to the fly and completely missing it by six or seven inches, leaving the fly sitting there on the water untouched. Fortunately for the fishermen, there are occasions when trout take the dry fly with confidence and purpose. For their size, averaging about one and three quarter pounds, these corrib trout put up a tremendous fight and they're never caught until they're safely in the net. Conditions play a large part in determining whether an angler is successful or not. But when you see those black squalls, or cat's paws, as they're sometimes known, Roy is never confident about top of the water fishing. Bright, blustery conditions, even though the gulls indicate plenty of fly, are not the best. Fish tend to slash at the dry fly in these conditions, and mistakes are common. A change of tactics once again to a different form of dry fly fishing may prove more successful. Roy calls this drift on dries. He's casting a team of two flies ahead, leaving them more or less static on the water and simply retrieving the slack line as the boat drifts on. This allows the angler to reach a large area of water with his dry flies hopefully covering a feeding fish. The static fly seems to induce a more positive take. There is a multitude of fly patterns to use at olive time. They range in color from dark claret to bright gold. And one of Roy's all-time favorites is the golden olive. And the first thing to tie in is a sort of a, an orange amber flush tag. Just part way around the bend of the hook. Again, it's a little, little hot spot just for the, the fish to aim at. Probably acts as an attractor as well. We take our silk back to the tag and tie in. Again, it's a golden pheasant topping. This has to be tied in so that the, the curve is upwards. And the next thing to tie in is a fine oval gold tinsel rib. Gold on of seals for her. Then we rib up in the opposite direction. This is a hen hackle of golden olive, which I'll particularly favour uh, for this pattern. It tends to be a bit more mobile than the, uh, the cock hackles. It probably does make a difference. Thing to tie in is a bronze mallard wing folded. I'll just place that on top of the, the fly, tie it in. Just 
for this, so it's really nice, yeah. That's okay. Trim off the excess. Build up the head and the silk. A fly very similar to the golden olive is the cock robin. This is a particularly versatile fly and one of Roy's favourites. In size 12 and 14 it is exceptionally good as an olive nymph pattern and on a size 8 hook is a very useful mayfly nymph imitation. In both cases these tines must be slim and sleek and it does best in bright conditions.